My pleasure to uh, be invited to chair this uh, discussion. Um, my background is really crop protection, but I've had resistance in agricultural pests all through my career. So anyway, um, I haven't had any pre uh, question, so it's really up to the audience now to produce some questions. So please put your hand up, we'll get a microphone to you as quickly as we can. Hello, my name is Peter Whittle, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for rent kill Initial Worldwide. I was very interested to compare and contrast all of the presentations here this afternoon, and to me they started to exemplify an issue which I think we have across the world, which is almost the connection between different bodies within the vector control chain. It starts with the identification of the actives which control, which Professor Hemingway um, elegantly showed. Um, Mr. Wage then showed um, how there are blockages to getting these things to market, uh, and then the commoditization of these things. And as somebody who is intimately involved with most, both these things and then subsequently delivering service on the ground. One of the things that um, I would comment on is that it's very difficult to use more expensive treatments or to do a full treatment, mainly because the people you are selling to, often local municipals, um, cannot afford what we're actually offering. Um, I wonder if any of you has any experience, therefore, in terms of creating a total value chain model which looks at not just the value-based uh, buying opportunities um, which you were um, criticizing Professor Hemingway, but right the way through to the value created uh, socioeconomically for societies which are then free of dengue or free of malaria, etc. Because I think that is something which ultimately will, con will um, help this total cause. So it won't surprise you, I think, um, to know that the answer to that is yes. We are starting to look at that. It, it isn't simple. Um, we are engaging the Gates Foundation, who are one of our major funders in doing that. Um, and I think unless we create that total value chain, we're never going to get any traction um, with the sort of set here. But uh, um, there are meetings ongoing right now in terms of how we start and pull that together. Um, we are engaging numerous of the donor communities as well and trying to make sure they're on board. I think we've already got the likes of the WHO starting to come on board as well. But I don't think any of us underestimate the magnitude of the tasks that we've got ahead um, because there aren't a, um, an endless number of dollars out there. And it is going to be more expensive um, just in, in straight control terms to put this in place. There is no question about that. Um, so we have to bring in the modelers and economists to make sure that we really do make that argument and that the common good that's going to get um, resulted from this um, program, if we do it right, is really understood by everybody who's part of that value chain. Because without that, we're never going to get to where we need to go. So um, my experience of... Uh, uh, I worked uh, for a, a number of years, a few years ago now, developing a, with a part of a big project to develop a biological pesticide for control of locusts and grasshoppers. And what was interesting about that was we were tasked with coming up with something that was environmentally less damaging than uh, broad-spectrum chemical insecticides. And we actually did that. I thought the project was a major success in terms of developing uh, a biological pesticide produced and registered for use in Africa. And it came in at about, uh, well, I'll make up the figure slightly, but something about $15 a hectare to use, a little bit less than that. And uh, the competing broad-spectrum chem broad chemical insecticides, you could spray for about $8 a hectare. So up on the face of it, we were really losing out. You could spray and control locusts for $8 or spend $15. But then we did a lot of work to, and you know, the reason we developed this technology was to uh, protect the environment. So when we looked at the impact on non-target species and we put a dollar value on the environmental impact, then the non-target impacts of the insecticides were about $10, whereas we had virtually no non-target impacts associated with the biological. So if you add these externalities, so the total product cost, the total cost to both the product and the end user impact, then our biological turned out to be better value for money it was, uh, than, the, than the broad spectrum chemical. But it's a challenge 
you know, the, the benefit of insecticide resistance management doesn't come on the day that you apply your insecticide. It's a very similar problem that this is a benefit for public good and for maintaining control for the next 10 or 20 years, allowing the supply chain to keep up with new product development. So I think it's a major challenge to actually go from taking technologies and just looking at the price, and I thought Janet put it very nicely, to actually looking at the value. And I, and I think what that requires is a little bit more vision. And um, I don't know, my sense is that maybe, I don't know, speak out of turn here, it would be nice if, I don't know how sympathetic WHO are to that sort of thinking. I mean, the Hoopies criteria are very prescriptive about here and now, and not very flexible for thinking about alternative products which might satisfy some of these longer term objectives. And that may be where you need to dissociate the Hoopers process which says, is this gizmo fit for purpose in terms of does it fulfill a, a certain specific set of criteria to really the, the broader discussion, which I don't think is, belongs in that Hoopers agenda within the, the sort of set. Um, but I think the WHO more broadly, um, because of its normative functions and because it's, of its advisory functions, needs to be behind this. And I think we've, we've got them to that point, um, at least in terms of putting the global plan in place. Um, and I think they're now starting to, to move some activities around that. Um, but the more ammunition we can actually provide to that process um, that gives them the figures um, and that um, really sort of puts that out in terms of, of lives saved and, and the health and that public good, the better. Um, because if we're not going to get those figures and, and that ammunition for them, then WHO on its own can't do this. One of the issues with, if we're looking at, um, at mosquito nets, for example, the mosquito nets today, parethroid treated nets, are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So any new uh, uh, net with a novel formulation, a non-parethroid insecticide, let's say, that is brought onto the market will, by definition, be more expensive. And of course, because the price of nets has dropped so much, that gap is getting larger and larger and larger. So it's really crucial that this issue is the, the idea of cost effectiveness is brought into to the buyers of, a, of vector control products mm -hmm. as early as possible so that when those products are ready, they, the right product can be put in the right place. Could I just add a bit about the locust work? <coughs> um, in Africa, the locusts tend to come up some years and not be present for many years. And so the terms of production is very difficult. Uh, as well as the extra cost. But it's interesting in Australia, they do uh, have a, a, a locus that occurs most years, and they've been using the biological control much more consistently uh, because the added uh, value there is on uh, organic agriculture and also pastures uh, when they want to export beef to, to other countries. So. It depends on the local context as to whether your biological um, takes on or not. But going back to the question of WHO, I mean, they are always looking at it as a global picture and they want something that's going to work as far as possible globally. And I think um, the big problem for certainly malaria is that you've got big differences between uh, the true tropics where you've got rainfall and temperature adequate for the mosquitoes throughout the year, and other countries more on the perimeter where you've got a distinct rainfall season. And you don't necessarily need the long persistence of your molecule um, to, to keep the numbers of malaria cases down. And I think the fact that we've gone for this long-term persistence with pyrethroids on nets which are lasting umpteen years, yeah, the, the local population is continually exposed to this uh, problem of, of selecting for resistance. Um, it, it's certainly much easier in agriculture where you've got different crops and, and things. And just to quote something that was done where I used to work in um, Zimbabwe, they divided the country into three zones. And so when we spotted the caricides, a uh, bit of resistance uh, with red spider mite, uh, they had fortunately a number of uh, caricides with different uh, modes of action. And so 
they allotted one mode of action to one part of the country for two years, then it went to the second part for the next two years and so on. And so over six years, it was rotated. I don't know whether it's still in function, but up until about the year 2000, it had worked for about 30 years very effectively. And the original cause of resistance was to dimethoate, and uh, the mites are now, or were in 2000, susceptible to dimethoate because it was only, an OP was only used uh, for two years and six. Now, how you can translate that sort of thing with variations in resistance already in the population by different modes of action, I don't know. Anyway, more questions from the, the audience? Ah. Yes. This one. Um, you talk about the new uh, insects that have more expensive. How long will that be the case? Because how are we going to be expensive ones? Is it then presumably if there's a demand for them, the price will come back and then will be a gradual decrease? Over time, it, almost certainly the prices will come down, yes, but it's a question. Sorry? Well, the, the, the thing I was referring to there was the fact that differential was a differential between the pyrethroids and something new coming in now, and that the, you know, they've benefited from 30 years of use and price erosion over that, that period of time. Um, it's unlikely we'll have an area, there'll be another area of chemistry like the pyrethroids. So I, I, you know, the nearest thing we have is the chloronicotinyl chemistry, and you can see how much the price has dropped of that, and it's not, it's not quite so great. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't count on, you know, it's not going to happen in 10 years. It's, it'll be over a longer period of time than that, I think. So, I mean, I think I, I see the pyrethroids as a, a pinnacle of insecticide chemistry in terms of their potency and physical chemical properties. I think that they are unique, and I don't think we'll, it's famous last words, of course, I don't think we'll see anything like that for a, for a while uh, in terms of um, that level of potency and um, sort of uh, utility as well. So there's a question here. Um, you've talked a bit more about um, the impact of resistance on malaria, but what's the impact of resistance on dengue fever? Um, so I, I think, again, we, we have very little data. What we do know is that pyrethroid resistance in particular in Aedes aegypti has rocketed over the last few years, um, but we've got no operational data to, to demonstrate whether that is significant or not. Um, a lot of it is KDR, but KDR in Aedes aegypti looks very different to KDR in Anopheles, <clears throat> just because of the Coodon bias there. So it's a much stronger mechanism in the Aedes. Um, I think we need more um, work to, to actually try and work out how much of a problem that's been. But I think a bigger problem with Aedes, to be perfectly honest, is finding vector control that really works um, very well. Um, for dengue at the moment, we don't have a, a technology that is is really good um, for for dengue control. Is there any data on the differential spread of resistance in the Aedes versus Aedes? I might expect to um, Aedes the do type, for example, certainly you can move around the world a lot more effectively than the non-species. Can you get at this from any of the not easily. We've got, um, because you can use some of these molecular tools, um, we can actually see where resistance is arising and how it's moving. So uh, Charles Wanji in, in Anopheles funestus um, has some really elegant data to show how many times pyrethroid resistance has arisen in funestus and where the barriers to gene flow are. Um, we know that we've got at least eight or nine different um, foci of resistance in Aedes aegypti for pyrethroid resistance where it's arisen independently. So it's not just that it's come up once and gone everywhere worldwide. Um, but um, the level of data that is out there for aegypti is nowhere near the level at the moment that we've got for Funestus and, and Gambi. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. Helen. Um, so it slightly relates to that. Um, uh, on some of the maps, you had uh, red dots for both resistance and uh, phenotypic resistance and identifying mechanisms mm. right next to green dots. Mm. So do you have a sense of 
is, is that some sort of artifact of sampling or is that genuine and do you have a reason why um, uh, presumably these are places that have also had bed nets for about the same amount of time or what is it that contributes to the very fine scale, apparent fine scale differentiation between resistance? A lot of that is due to the, um, the, the view of the map. So if you, if you uh, focus in, you'll be able to have a lot better spatial uh, um, uh, differentiation between the different points, but you do have uh, overlapping points. Um, and it could be uh, uh, the fact that you've had some points tested in 2000 and then you had resistance developing because there's multiple. So you have to choose where, which year you, you, take, you make your map from. Uh, so, yeah, but in general, in general, the picture is, is fairly uh, consistent in that where you have the resistance mechanisms identified, you also have resistance confirmed. Uh, may I ask you to uh, show uh, your appreciation for the four excellent presentations this afternoon and uh, look forward to any further discussions uh, later on. Thank you very much.